Greetings ladies and mentalgens and welcome to today's reddit series video from the subreddit hfy called Retreat Hull Chapter 6 Written by Lithy Dragon I must be going insane. Bryn was sprinting across an open field scraped and packed to dirt, surrounded by hundreds of non-Kishmen, aliens from another world. Towards the line of whirling contraptions that could fly. I must be going insane. It's the only explanation. The marines ahead of him slowed, turning towards a specific craft. This one had two wings sticking out of either side of it, with great spinning blades whirling above the columns and the end of each wing. First platoon, second squad, first platoon, second squad. A marine was shouting, waving them towards the rumbling monstrosity. The marines piled into the craft, ducking as they stomped up a short ramp and into the belly of the beast. Bren followed them. I'm definitely going insane. Inside, the marines were unslinging their packs and dropping into the seats mounted on the outer shell. Following suit, Rin fumbled for the straps on his own pack, and soon found himself being shoved into a seat and strapped in. Snugging the straps, Dubois gave him a slap on the shoulder and moved his seat further in the craft. Through the small window on the opposite wall, Rin could see the smaller flying vehicles. The ones that had the bigger sets of blades and the smaller set of blades were their tail, and they were already lifting off, loaded with marines. The rest of the squad piled in, along with the marines from another squad. Then the ramp was raised and the tones of the contraption changed. Jostling slightly, Bryn looked at partly open ramp. Above and below were in the air. He latched his hands onto the seat. The craft lifted and the view from the ramp spun, bringing the portal into view as it turned north to west. Already the hundred feet in the air, Rin was granted a bird's-eye view of the human side of the portal. Past a fortified defensive line, he saw the ordered rows of orchards and farms surrounding a huge complex of bizarre structures that looked like long rows of white half-barrels. Beyond that was a great highway, stretching into the distance past the mountains covering the green trees and brown shrubs. He felt a faint rumble and thunk beneath him as a glance through a small window opposite him revealed the vertical columns of the spinning blades had rotated forward. Glancing backwards again, Rin saw the portal receding at an increasing pace, a line of the other flying craft trailing behind them as the rest of the battalion loaded and took off. "'How are you holding up?' Bradford shouted, clapping him on the back. She had been several marines ahead of him when they'd boarded. She must have swapped seats when she wasn't looking.' I'm sitting in a chair in the sky. Ha! Ah, he'll get used to it. She waved at Marine near the ramp. Just look at the Hicks. He's already asleep. Ah, Hicks don't count jabs. Edison cut in from the seat to Rin's right. The man's a freak of nature. Put him on anything that moves and he's out. Almost immediately. Rin grew gripped his seat as he shuddered and rattled. Relax, Edison said. It's just a bit of turbulence. Probably from the portal. It's having some weird effects in the weather. Bradford wrapped her knuckles on the steel helmet of his head. Glad to see that you found something to protect your grape. Yeah, he said, latching onto the distraction, tapping on the Kishman helmet himself. Your helmets don't fit. Gomez found this somewhere. Yeah, still not the best fit, but it works. Better than nothing, at least, Bradford grinned. Hot damn, that's a sight. Kowalski said, pointing out the back ramp at the line of mechanical birds falling into formation around them. This has got to be one of the largest air assaults since fricking. I don't fricking know since when. Shock and awe, man, Kimber said. Shock and mother fricking awe. Hoorah! I'm just surprised that we were able to mobilize all of this in such short notice. Samson waved the craft around him. Organizing an operation like this is normally takes weeks, at least. I know, right? Bradford laughed. The portal kicked off a mad scramble. Everyone's been on high alert and ready to go since it popped up. Rin looked back at the ramp and was amazed to see that the portal so far in the distance behind them, even more astounding, was the appearance of the royal host camp of F.O.B. Williams below them. He thought the twenty-minute ride in the front lines to the portal was amazing, a distance it would have taken the royal host a day to march. We've been in the air for mere minutes, and we're already crossing the Yankai River. Rin sat back and considered the fact for a moment. We haven't taken the offensive across the Yankai in months, 
and here I am, flying through the sky, joining the band of marauding chaos demons in an assault on the Alvin camp, nearly into the next country. He adjusted his helmet on his head, not liking how it chafed against his ears, and he tried to relax. Once you get used to the noise, the droning of the blades is actually kind of soothing. Ready up, marines, we're five mics out. Ren blinked. He hadn't fallen asleep, but he had drifted away to the here and now. He hadn't noticed how much time had passed. Are we almost there already? Around him, marines shoved each other awake and double-checked their weapons and gear. Ren adjusted his helmet again and gave himself a quick pat-down, looking for anything that seemed out of place. Keep your ears open, shouted an unfamiliar marine, tethered to the back of the manning the mounted machine gun. The Hueys are engaging psyops, and we're in two mics out. Best day ever, Kowalski shouted. Let's kill us some freaking kibblers. Hoorah! The craft rolled, and Run found himself staring at the marine across from him, while his stomach tried to do its level best to crawl up his throat. The world reeled outside and back of the ramp, and the craft leveled out, and much closer to the ground. The swarm of whirling birds of death jockeyed around them. Two mics, the marine around them, all grinned at each other. At first, Rin couldn't hear anything over the noise and the craft he was in. Straining his ears, he started to make out the sounds of some string instruments, the fluttering of a flute. Then the horns began. The marine on the machine gun leaned forward in the ramp, gripping at his weapon, eager for targets. He bores, putting his hands on his earmuffs. Are you freaking crapping me? What's the problem? Bradford asked. There's nothing there, Sergeant, the Marine shouted, half turning to face her. Just a bunch of freaking trees. What do you mean, just a bunch of freaking trees? I mean, just freaking trees, he pointed out the ramp at the uninterrupted forest below. We just flew over the target. Did we make a wrong turn somewhere? Edison asked. No, we're right on target, the Marine shouted. He paused and listened again to the horizon and tilted. We're making another pass. Raiders not giving with what we're seeing. Could it be a... Eh? Bradford stopped mid-sentence as Ren unbuckled himself and lurched to the ramp. Raising himself with one hand on the ceiling, he felt a hand clamp down on his tail. I got you, brah, Stephenson shouted. Ignoring him, Ren spun and stand at detection artifice. It couldn't detect the elves through the invisibility or illusions, but it could detect... Aha! Somebody's leaking too much mana. Shifting his grip on his staff, he fired off a hasty disruption pulse. It was a quick, dirty, and low-powered, but it did the job. A flicker of mana burst into the edges of the illusion, disrupting a large swath and revealing the elven camp below for several seconds, before the illusion restabilized and the hole collapsed. Crap, it's right there! The marine on the gun shouted as several rockets flashed from one of the vipers. They shot right through the illusion the trees to strike the ground in rapid series of detonations. Completely disrupted by the rockets, the illusion collapsed, revealing the urban camp in its entirety. We're going in, shouted the marine, leaning out to spit a burst of machine gun fire into the camp as the craft rolled again. Ren stumbled, and Stephens yanked in his tail, hauling him back into the craft. The ground came rushing up as they came to a land, and several pulses of small arms spellfire flashed by. Something tinked against the frame. As he's hot, the marine gun shouted as the ram dropped and he swung his weapon clear. Piled out. Rin surged down the ramp with the rest of the marines as spellfire flashed and gunfire rattled around him while the orchestral symphony bled out. Stumbling, he struggled to hold on to the pack someone had shoved into his hands while firing a mana pulse in the general direction of a group of Alban regulars charging towards them. Leaf green tents toppled and tumbled across the ground as thundering sky carriages landed and powered marines into the camp. Their ride roared and lifted into the air, swinging clear as the small arm starburst tracked after it. None hit. Rin dropped his pack and threw up his shield where he stood. Several shard bursts deflected off, but they were all shot wide anyway. The squad of elves charged, swords high, but they were cut down by sustained rapid fire from Kowalski and Gomez. Eat crap and die, frickers! I got one! I freaking got one! You freaking got five of them, Goma! Eyes front, marines, Bradford shouted. Clear their elves, he killed anything that's hostile, but remember, we want prisoners. Two five, 
Retreat how? Get him, boys. Contracting his shield, Rin grabbed his pack and dragged it behind him as he sprinted after the marines. A hundred tails, several bursts of gunfire, and a few explosions later, and the fight was over. Is that it? Dubois asked as the gunfire tapered off around him, only the whirl of the rumble of the flying machines overhead and a few shouts from the marines remained. That's it, Bradford confirmed while Rin took the opportunity to properly shoulder his pack, nearly falling over in the process. Well, that was a little, um, anticlimactic, Edison said. Frick your big words, it's a goddamn disappointing is what it is. That's a bigger word. Nobody asked you, Goma. There must have been fifty people defending this camp, Alan Rawaju said, looking about at the torn-up tents and half-collapsed buildings. No more. Fifty freaking people, Kowalski laughed. We just dropped half a goddamn battalion on these heavy air support with fifty freaking people. Looks that way, Bradford said, shaking her head. Crap! There's a shock and awe, and then there's freaking overkill, Samson said. Overkill is just more kill, Kowalski declared. No such thing as too much kill. Right, Bradford laughed. All right, stick together. We still got some mopping up to do. And a whole camp to search for anything that we can haul off. Let's go find the LT and see what he's got for us. Britton picked his way through the rows of scattered and still standing tents. Then they were made out of a strange leaf-like fabric that he had never seen before. I wonder if they groaned. He paused, looking about. Something's wrong, Shields, Edison asked. I've never been in an Alban camp before, he looked at the Marines. Seven years of war, and I've never set foot in an Alban camp. He gestured at the rows of elegant green tents surrounding them. We've beaten them, driven them back, and forced them to withdraw, even overrun them a time or two. But we never managed to push them back so hard that they couldn't decamp. They really had you by the short hairs, didn't they? Dubois said. I don't, he snorted, staring out across the field of tents. Yeah, yeah, they did. Well, you've got us here now, Kowalski said, throwing an arm over his shoulder. We can get all their areas together. Let's keep moving, Bradford said. The birds only have so much flight time before they got to go back and refuel, and I don't want to get stuck here overnight. The pens are just up ahead. The pens, the thought sent a shiver down his spine. Hope and fear warring in his gut from what they might find. Clearing the last row of tents, a large corral came into view, constructed with a typical Alvin style. That looks, um, delicately brutal, Dubois said, looking at the inward curving spines and spires at the top of the high fence. Those two words don't go together, Edison objected. How can? Ah, frick it, you're right. There's a gate over there, Bradford said, leading them away. It's open. It looks empty, Samson chimed in as they approached. Bradford pushed the gate fully open and walked inside. Rin slowly walked into the center and stopped staring at an object in the ground as the marines fanned out to investigate. There's not much here, Kimber said, gesturing about. Couple lean-tos for shelter, a put over there for crapping in. Looks hand-dug. How can you tell it was hand-dug? Gomez asked. You can see the finger tracks in the walls. Look at how the ground was all tore up, Miller said, pointing at the bare dirt and mud. There must have been hundreds of people in here. None of them are here anymore, Kowalski said. Where did they all go? Kovacs asked. With the army to the other side of the river, Bradford frowned at the obvious. Yeah, frick. Ah, oh, Jesus, Edison said, walking up to Rin. What? Bradford asked. There were kids here. He bent over to pick up a crude doll that Rin had been staring at and held it for everyone to view. Frick! Echo One, this is Echo One, standing by to make a report, Bradford said into a radio headset. It was in one of the boxes that she had smuggled out of the supply tent with Rin. She listened to the response and then Rin couldn't hear, and then continued. Echo One Actual, this is Echo One Two. We're at the corral, but the gate was open. It's been cleared out. Ground signs indicate several hundred people were held here, including children. Another pause as she listened to the response. Echo 1-2 will go out. Bradford frowned at the corral around her. All right, make sure we got plenty of pictures. Intel wants them, and I'm sure that the brass will feed them to the press. After that, we're heading back to the LZ. There's a lot of gear that we'll have to sort through. 
Rin gently took the doll from Edison and examined it. It was mostly rags tied together with a bit of stuffing in the head. Crudely shaped like a kishman, it had mismatched buttons sewn for eyes and it was missing an ear. He felt a hand on his shoulder. You're going to be okay, Shields? Bradford asked. Yeah, he said, showing her the doll. Maya had a doll like this. She called it Binkles. She carried him everywhere. Gripping the doll, he twisted and tried to stuff it into his pack. After he struggled for a moment, Bradford helped him stow it away. I'm ready to go, he said, looking across the corral. Yeah, let's get out of here, Bradford agreed. Dubois, Stevens, you guys get enough pictures. Yeah, Sergeant, Stephens said, his irrepressibly chill attitude subdued. About as much as we can get, Dubois confirmed, stowing the camera away. Let's get back to the LZ. Aye, Sergeant. Rin stood up and stretched, feeding the satisfying pop and crackle up his spine. Above and below, the stuff weighs on you. He rubbed his hand across his face, and he scratched behind his ear. He had been sorting through the gear for the last hour, inspecting captured equipment and doing his best to tell the marines what it all was, and if it was worth holding back or not. At least the helos and ospreys have flown up into the higher, wider pattern. I could barely hear myself think of the racket. So you sure you can't make use of one of these things? Edison asked, picking up a gem staff of the Elven Mage. No, I can't. He said, pointing the mana gem bound to the staff near the top. See this? That's a mana gem. Only the elves can make them. We haven't figured out how. What is it? It kind of looks like an emerald or something. It's, um, it's, it's like a mana crystal, but with much more complex structure. It's very stable, so it can't be converted into semantic mana and used up like a mana crystal. But it can store semantic mana, and it makes it easier for elf wielding to channel mana, both in using stored semantic mana to cast spells and drawing out ethereal mana. Kinda like your articulation staff. Yeah, same basic concept. So why can't you use it? Rin sighed. Because when an elf makes a gem, it gets personally tuned to them. Only that elf could use it, he shrugged. From what we understand about them, creating one is a difficult and arduous process for an elf, and entails the risk for them. Many elves never create a mana gem in the first place. Edison set the staff and picked up a gem blade, examining the ruby-like gem set into the pommel. Do they all get worked into stuff? I believe so, yes, Rin said, picking up a water bottle and examining the material for a moment before taking a drink. This plastic stuff is fascinating. We've only ever seen them set into specialized articulations, like a mage staff or a gem blade, matching the elves' profession or specialization. Not two are alike, he twisted the cap back on. There are rumors that some mana gems are imbued with such a complex structure, or with so much of the essence of the elf that made them, that they are almost alive, with personality all of their own. Really? Edison swung the blade a few times, like a living talking sword. So the rumors go, Rin said, setting down the bottle, but I don't think it's more than just a fantastical speculation and rumor. You found yourself a souvenir? Kowalski asked, wandering over to Bradford and Miller. Nah, I gotta go back with the rest of the hall of the eggheads to study. We didn't get enough of these things that weren't tore up or blown to crap by the artillery. Don't we have enough here? Just sneak it into your pack or something. I wish my pack's not that big, he shook his head, setting the sword back and the important or useful pile of captured gear. Besides, that's one of them lightsaber crap asses. Then there was only a handful of those fricks and the magi types here. Most of them were just regulars. They all died fast enough, Kowalski shook his head. Too bad, I wanted to get my hands on a life keebler so I could just beat him to death. That kind of defeats the point of taking prisoners, Kowalski, Bradford laughed. I'd still be worth the satisfaction. Couple of boys in second platoon nearly caught themselves one of the wizard types, Kimbler grunted, as he and another marine hauled a heavy chest over for inspection pile. The rest of the second squad and a few of the marines from third squad were following him with a half dozen more chests. But the bastard made his hands all glowy and put a knife hand to his chin and blew his own brains out. He mimicked the motion. Kimber, aren't you supposed to be taking it easy with that arm? Nah, it's fine, Sergeant. He waved a concern away. Maybe only popped a couple stitches. Bradford rolled her eyes. 
Anyway, shields! LT, he said, as he tapping the chest and the others were stacked up with him. I think you guys are going to get a kick out of what we found in the big tents. Mayers broke away from the conversation and walked over to the Staff Sergeant Rickles. What do you got here, Corporal? A whole frickwad of mana crystals, Kimba said, popping the latch on his chest and flipping the lid open. There's another ten chests back there, just like this one, all chocked full of them. Gods above and below, Rin said, as his ears were standing straight. That's enough to supply. He flicked an ear. Well, a whole army. Good find, Corporal, Rickles said, tapping him on the shoulder. Kimber only winced a little. Take a breather and hydrate. First squad has been standing here for ten minutes with the schlongs in their hands for the last ten minutes. They can haul the rest over. Kimber nodded, taking a water bottle and sitting down on one of the chests. It's the big tent over there, three tents down from the half blowed up hut. We stack them all out in front before we hold these over. You copy that, Sergeant Tanner? Yes, Sergeant. Right then, go to it. Aye, Staff Sergeant. With a satisfied nod, Rickles turned back to his conversation with Mayor, and they stepped away. You sure we're going to have enough room for all the scrap, sir? Captain Spader has just got off the horn with the CO. They're sending a couple of flights of super stadions for cargo lift, so it shouldn't be a problem. Lieutenant, sir, Ren spoke up, shifting from foot to foot as he eyed the arsenal before him. Yes, I yet. May I stock up, sir? He asked, waving at the chest. I've only got a crystal and a half left. Help yourself, second artificer. We've got plenty, and I'd hate to have any of you run out of ammo. Thank you, sir. Rin said, barely stopping himself from giving the lieutenant a crisp bow. No saluting in combat zones. Mayers nodded and resumed walking away. Rin jumped on the chest, greedily pulling out a crystal after crystal and stuffing every single pouch that he had with them. Jesus, you're like a kid in a candy store, Kimber laughed. You never run out of ammo before, Kowalski said, snagging a couple fist-sized crystals and tucking them into a pouch. His pouches topped off, including a few crystals large enough to properly feed the artillery piece. Rin sat back, satisfied. I think I'm carrying more mana crystals right now than I've personally handled in the last three years. I think we made a good haul, Bradford said with an approving nod. They managed to burn a lot of their documents and gear, but we got a lot of it too. Captured a bunch of tech, including some comms gadget and their goddamn magazine. I just wish that we had more of a fight, Kowalski said, shaking his head. I wanted to frick up some more Keeblers. Rin rolled an ear at Kowalski. I like your marine way of fighting a lot better than what I'm used to, but I've had enough of fights. I don't need more. Kowalski shrugged, giving Rin an understanding nod. Meh, it was good enough, Kimber said, taking another swig of water. But, hey, real talk, important question. What would you do for a billion dollars? I'd do a lot for a billion dollars, Kowalski said. There isn't anything I wouldn't do for a billion dollars, said one of the marines from 3rd Squad. Rin didn't know his name. Would you suck a billion schlongs for a billion dollars? Dude, I've already said, there isn't anything that I wouldn't do for a billion dollars. I don't know, man, Stefan said. That's a lot of schlongs. Dude, there isn't anything I wouldn't do for a billion dollars. But that's a billion schlongs. Just line them up, man. That's a billion dollars. You'd never finish. But it's a billion dollars. Dude, that's a dollar a schlong. Rung stared at the confused mix of fascination and horror at the conversation. Are they really discussing this? He glanced at Bradford. She was merely rolling her eyes and laughing at the conversation, though he didn't miss that she was firmly not participating. Dude, five dollars a schlong is a rip-off. You're talking a dollar a schlong. Yeah, but... The marine from the third platoon stopped mid-sentence and turned, pushing Stephens out of his way. This conversation is over. I just crapped myself. What? Kevin laughed. Just crap myself. Move! He shoved past Dubois and ran off to the rest of Marines, burst out laughing. Rin saw an osprey sitting down and cleared the area a couple hundred pods past him. He did he just crap himself to get out of a conversation he was losing? Bradford chuckled, pointing after him. I think he did, Edison said, struggling for breath. What about you, Miller? Kimber said. You've been silently staring at the trees this whole time. 
What would you do for a billion dollars? Shut up, Miller said, not shifting his gaze. What? Kimber asked, coughing at another laugh. I said, shut the frick up, Miller snapped. What do you see, Miller? Bradford asked, stepping up to his side. Levity instantly forgotten. Rin jumped to his feet, joining them. I don't know. Something doesn't feel right, he nodded at the tree line. There is no bird singing over there. I don't see anything, Kowalski said, peering through the pair of binoculars. Rub it up, Sergeant, Mayer said, walking over. We're pulling out. He paused. Something up? Don't know, sir, Bradford said, pulling up a telescope like device out of a pouch. Maybe. Wren squinted, running his detection artifice again. I'm not detecting anything, but it's a good distance to the tree line. Bradford fiddled with the device for a moment before putting it up to her eye. Crap! Contact! Hostiles in the trees, visible on thermals. She stuffed the device back in a pouch and brought up a rifle as Miller started snapping off shots into the trees. The swamp of her grenade launcher joined the rapid staccato of Kowalski's SAW, and suddenly the tree line was filled with owls. Hostiles in the tree line, Mayer shouted as he grabbed the radio hand device. All units, this is Echo 1 Actual. Multiple hostiles in the eastern tree line, visible on thermals. Spell fires flashed by and Rin threw up a shield, deflecting the blasts overhead. Then his blood ran cold. The trees seemed to sway out of the way as their mage tower strode into the camp. Jesus freaking Walker! Kowalski shouted, turning his saw to hose down the spindly three-story tower. The rounds fled harmlessly against the personal shields projected by its mage crew. The tower swiftly cleared the trees, its six legs letting it scramble over the uneven terrain with ease. It slammed to a halt, barely swaying, and the heavy shard burst from the splendles at the top. It cracked overhead and slammed into the osprey as it desperately tried to lift off, the violent explosion sending debris and shrapnel flying over the field. Frick! Kimber shouted. We've got a boat down! Rin heard another marine shout. Dozens of shard bursts snapped and crackled towards them. He angled his shields to deflect all that he could. Another flash came from the spindles on the top of the tower, but instead of a shard burst, a pillar of energy shot up and arched over to the tower as hundreds of owls pouring out their trees, doming them over the area shield. It stabilized just in time as several streaks were slammed into the rapid succession, bombarding Rin and the marines with concussive of heavy explosions. The shield rippled briefly, but was otherwise unperturbed. Crap, it looks like a heavy artillery carpet bombing to take down eight of those things. How much can one hold up to? Bradford asked. The spindle splashed again, and the heavy shard burst thumped on the ground halfway across the camp. One of its legs swung up, over and down. The tower started to move forward, one leg at a time. I don't know, Rin said. It takes us an hour of bombardment with several artillery pieces to bring one down. We've never brought down more than three. Danger close, danger close. The shout came from seconds before the crackling thunder of the war dog, splattering against the tower shields, followed by a second later by a short brrrt. The shields howled. A flash pulsed out from the spindles, and Rin watched as the heavy shard burst flew towards the warthog as it blanketed away from its attack. It was out of range and it's going to miss. Rin's thoughts were interrupted when the shard burst reached a maximum range and detonated, bursting into a core of mana shards and extending it several hundred meters more. The shards riddled the warthog and one of the bulbs at the back and the ripping off of the tail, fins, and a third of the wing, and the half of the other. Rin watched as the warthog shuddered across the sky, waiting for it to fall. He kept waiting as, to his utter amazement, it managed to recover. It flew off, trailing smoke, but still flying. Almost as if in a rage of lack of a kill, another shard burst flew from the tower and thumped into the ground. Too close for comfort, dirt and the bee rained down, scattering by his shields. LT, Bradford shouted. I saw it, he responded, and continued shouting into his radio. Another explosion thumped into the far side of the elven shield, and the tower continued to advance. The marines of the eastern side of the camp were steaming back into the positions, or past them, pressed back by several hundred elves advancing with the walker, spitting lesser shard bursts. Frick! Mayer shouted. Pull back, sergeant. The elves is too hot. We're outnumbered, and we don't know what it'll take to bring that shield down. 
We're going to get away from that thing and find a new extraction point. The shield crept towards them. Tashan! Rin cursed, crunching his shield and throwing an angled wall up directly between them and the tower. The heavy shard burst flashed out and skipped off his shield and to detonate harmlessly in the air above them. The owls will overtake you in trees, Rin said. They can draw mana from them somehow. Frick! Mayers cursed. Well, we can't stay here. They'll overrun us. A streak of smoke and fire shot up from behind them and slammed into the shield, again with no effect. Rin reconfigured his shield to deflect a renewed volley of shard bursts coming from the elven mages. They're all bunching under my shield. I can't hold off the mage tower by myself. Sir, I have an idea. I need the javelin teams, Bradford said. Sergeant, I know what you're thinking, and you're freaking crazy. Sir, Bradford stared him down. We've got a yacht. Just give me a javelin team. We can do it. Another shower burst thumped on the ground ahead of them. Rin couldn't deflect that one. A salvo of smoke and fire from the viper flashed against the shield and continued to edge closer. Rin heard something shouting from a corpsman. Damn it, Mayers cursed. Whiskey 2, this is Echo 1 Actual. I need a javelin team on my position, ASAP. He paused. Whiskey 2 Actual, Echo 1 Actual. We're at the loot dump under the friendly shield. I've got a squad going under the enemy shields with our embedded Kishman to put fire directly on the tower. Echo 1 Actual, copies out. He threw down his headset. The rest of the company and the weapons company are putting back to here and are going to withdraw to the tree line. Second artificer. Sir! Rin kept his attention focused on the tower and the encroaching owls, ready to try and deflect another shard burst. How many people can you effectively cover in there? Much more than the second squad will be at tight at the range, sir. Myers grimaced. Two teams of marines lugged in fat tubes jogged up. Javelins as ordered, sir. Sergeant Bradford, sir. Another shard burst thumped down behind them. Rin heard screams. Take your squad and these two javelin teams under that shield and take that freaking thing out. He stabbed a finger at the tower. The rest of the first platoon will fan out and draw the fire to try and give you some kind of cover. Aye, sir, Bradford shouted. Second squad on me. She loaded up a fresh round in her grenade launcher and fired it at the base of the shield. It struck at the starting pouring white smoke. Move up. Freaking A, Kowalski shouted. Let's go frick up some Keeblers. Rin narrowed the shield and sprinted forward, surrounded by marines. They passed several others, some lying down and others falling back, and some huddled under whatever cover they could find as the shard burst flashed around them. Some were dead. Several thumbs landed ahead on either side, and a heavy smoke screen began to billow around them. Moving through the smoke, Rin's nostrils burned, but the spell fire around him thinned and became more erratic. Another shard blast flared up overhead, and Rin heard something explode behind them. This is crazy. This is the most insane thing that I've ever done in my entire life, he thought as they ran up to the shield and passed through. It had never been meant to stop infantry, but I think it can work, which is more insane. Clearing the smoke, they became visible once more, and sharp bursts fired at them from all around. Rin flattened his shield, deflecting the shard burst barely over their heads, as human gunfire hammered around him. Owls started dropping. Contact left. Squad right. Squad right. Rag out, Samson shouted, ripping the pin out of a green ball. He chucked it overhead to them and to the left. It tumbled through the air, skipped off the ground once and exploded amidst the cluster of owls, sending them all to the ground. Half started screaming. The other half didn't. Kowalski's saw chattered to the right, mowing down lines of majors. Several shouts came from ahead of them, and the formation of Gemlage charged in. Contact front, Bradford shouted, bringing her rifle up, but Run beat her. Two rapid mana bursts punched into the leading Gemblades, toppling them to the ground with gaping holes in their chests. He quickly switched to a fire burst, dumping more mana into the artifice than he had been able to spare in a long time. The spell pulsed from his staff and burst into a cone directly in front of the gem blades, engulfing the entire formation of fire. They screamed. Jesus, shields, Kowalski shouted. Frickin' get some! Bradford's rifle barked several times and Rin flicked the shields to the left, 
deflecting a salvo of shard blasts covering the line of Alvin regulars as they charged. Rin was about to fire on them when the felt the manor surged. Instinctively, knowing that the angle was too steep to deflect the shard blast high enough, he flipped his shield forward and the blast from the tower flashed out, striking his shield, and deflecting down, right into the charging column of regulars. With a heavy thump, the dirt and pieces of owls went flying high. Well, that wasn't intentional, he thought as he flicked his shield back in place. But nobody needs to know that. Defilade, Bradford shouted, pointing at the newly formed crater. The squad surged forward. Rin hopped over the elven body parts and jumped into the crater as the other marines dove in around him. Kowalski and one of the javelin teams slid into cover behind a toppled cart that had been full of crates and barrels. Just get those javelins on target, Bradford shouted as the marines ripped and fled end of the front of their fat tubes. Rin sent another fireburst into a mixed cluster of valves, then desperately fumbled for a fresh mana crystal to his star for and dry. The flames engulfed all but two mages, but several shots from Bradford's rifle took them down. Reloading, she shouted, dropping the empty magazine out of her rifle and grabbing a fresh one to slam home. Reloading, Rin belatedly added as he shoved a fresh crystal into the staff and he restored his shield. Holy frick, there's people strapped to that thing, Dubois shouted. What? There's freaking people strapped to that thing. Eight, ten foxes. Crap, you're right, shouted one of the javelin marines. They're freaking cats, Kowalski shouted. Jesus, some of them are kids, Kimber said. They've got a freaking kid strapped to that thing. They're dead, Rin shouted, sending several mana pulses into a group of valves advancing on their position. Something heavy thumped against the shield from the outside. What? Radford asked. They're dead, Rin screamed back. Once you are linked to a tower, there is no undoing it. They're dead already. With a wordless scream, he threw an overcharged fireburst at the elves, ending them. The tower slowly strode forward. Frickin' kill that thing, Bradford shouted with the javelin teams. Seek is good, shouted the marines. It's lit up like a goddamn Christmas tree. Have lock, asked the partner. Have lock. Missile! Bradford grabbed Rin and pulled him from behind the tube. Firing, shouted the marine with the tube, and with a thump and a roar and a fat object spat out of the tube, and then took off with a jet of flame. It raced towards the tower and a second later slammed into the personal shields and the thundering report and ball of fire. The tower staggered, but continued forward. Hit! Crap, it's still up! Missile! Firing! As the missile thumped and roared away, Rin felt another mana surge. He tipped the shield up and curved it, just slightly, and the shard burst past the missile in flight, curving along the shield and thumping into the ground behind them. A second missile detonated against the tower, rocking it back. It stumbled two steps and then steadied itself, continuing forward. It's still up, Samson shouted as the dirt rained down around them. Reloading, Rin shouted. Kowalski's saw chatted away. Goma, where's that freaking ammo? Its shields are down, Bradford shouted. It's taking damage, hit it again. Missile, firing. A thump and a roar. The missile streaked towards the tower and detonated inside the twisted spire, just below the copula of its peak. The tower shattered, the copula was thrown high, broken in three. Fragments of gold and platinum spindles with support columns were blasted across the field, and the remains of the tower collapsed in an arching discharge of partially charged spell and shield bubble above them collapsed. Frick yeah! Eat crap, you frickin' crap bags! Frickin' come get some! All units, Echo 1 2, Splash 1, target down. Bradford ducked as more shard blasts flew overhead, and Rin hastily shoved a new mana crystal into his staff and threw the shield back up. Request closed air support. Frag out, Gomez shouted, lobbing a frag out of the defilade at the advancing group of owls. It exploded as Rin threw a mana pulse, followed by a fireburst at the mage leading the team of regulars, and then there was a helo of its head. Cannons on either side of it hummed, spraying streams of fire and showering them in brass casings. Rin flicked his shield over to protect them from the metal rain and sat down, panting. Explosions and gunfire crackled around them as the yells were pushed back into the trees. Kowalski crowed with victory and the marines surged around him. The crackle of explosions continued into the trees, 
until they were silenced by the thunderous boom that they grew over the towering column of smoke. Woohoo! Frick yeah! That was frickin' JDAM! Two thousand rounds of American frick you! We did it! Ren panted. We did it! That was the most insane thing that I've ever done in my entire life, he laughed. And we did it. Thanks to you, man, Bradford said, clapping him on the shoulder and giving him a good shake. We'd have been fricked a dozen times over if it weren't for you. You're a natural-born Gillibra, Stevens grinned at him. I am not going to lie, Alan Wojew said, sitting down on the edge of the crater. I did not think that you were going to survive that one. Then why the frick did you come with us, Doc? Kowalski asked. Because somebody had to hold you while you cried like a little biatch, he replied. <laughs> frick you, Doc. Hey, said one of the javelin marines, patting Ren on the shoulder. You can cover us any time, Shields. Ren nodded. Everyone good? Bradford asked. Nobody got any extra holes that they didn't have before. Just the holes you and Samson keep leaving in my heart, Jabs. You don't have a heart, Kowalski. The Marine Corps never issued you one. Oh, that's why there's a hole then. Makes sense now. Ren laughed. I think I'm starting to understand there's insanity now. All right, let's get out of this hole and see what we have to do to get an extract out of this prac show. Hoorah, replied several marines. Daryl woke up. It was dark, but not as dark as it should be. The sky above was black, lit only by a scattering of stars, but harsh, unnatural light flooded the nearby area. He slowly picked himself up. I must get away from here. I'm too close to the human's defenses. He placed a hand against the rough bark of the tree that had passed out beneath. The trees aren't talking to me. They don't even acknowledge my presence. He considered this for a moment. His manner reserves had replenished somewhat. Ethereal magic was just abundant here as it was in his world. Or is it just because I'm so close to the portal? Something to investigate. But first, I am too close to the human's defenses. With that manner he reserves low as they were, as Paul went the heavy manner draw of true invisibility, and instead blended himself in with his surroundings. Picking a direction away from the portal, he began to walk. End of chapter. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you did, please consider subscribing. If you wish to support the author, there is a link to the original story, so pop over there and give him your support. If you wish to support this channel, however, there are a few ways to do so. The best and easiest would be to share this video with other people, as well as liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. All of these things tell the algorithm that this channel is at least vaguely interesting and that we may share it with other people. If you wish to support the channel in some other manner, watching my other videos would also help tremendously. Or, if you really, really, really like, there is a link down below to leave a tip or to join the Patreon. Any and all support is very much appreciated. And I hope that you all have a good one until the next time. And I'll see you then. Cheers.